Okay, good morning everybody. Thanks for joining. We're getting there, so almost at the last of the conference. So congratulations to reach this target already. So why are you here today? Why are you here with us today? Um, we want to discuss with you about Blue Cloud, which is the flagship initiative of the Future of the Seas Innovations Programme of the European Commission, which is building an open science platform for marine research. And uh, it is a great example of how the three main components of EOS can uh, really work together. And we want to discuss with you today about its data federation model. So we, I mean, we usually say, we are uh, glad to say that Blue Cloud is a front runner uh, of data federation in practice, given the, I mean, how we successfully managed to bring together different data providers, nine uh, we have so far gathering uh, and providing access to more than 10 million data sets for marine uh, research and within a, a virtual research environment and with analytical tools that uh, we'll see uh, later on. So, um, we want to uh, assess with you this, and to do that, uh, we are uh, leveraging on the work already done by the OSC Task Force on Sustainability, and uh, the inputs that they've given already to a vision for further sustainability of the three components of EOSC, and we're going to um, assess how these scenarios adapt to, uh, to Blue Cloud and other uh, infrastructures and other uh, communities that we have in the uh, in the panel uh, today. Here is the agenda. So I'll first give the floor to Jessica Klemeyer from uh, EMBL and the Sustainability Task Force. Uh, I'll then give you a brief introduction of Blue Cloud and in particularly of how we are uh, approaching data federation. And then we give the floor to Anto Hennenbrook from FAO, uh, one of the partners of Blue Cloud, uh, and uh, behind uh, the team of fisheries and aquaculture division in, in FAO, and Carl Presser, uh, Premotech, and from, uh, he will bring in the perspective of another thematic cloud, the FNS cloud. Uh, in uh, working in the EOSC framework. Uh, last but not least, we have Alessandro Rizzo, IRD and Ferries, who will talk about future evolution uh, and interoperability uh, of interoperability and fair data management aspects in collaboration with Blue Cloud. And then we'll open a panel discussion. We hope you'll also join us there. So I call uh, Jessica on the floor. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the nice introduction and for inviting me to speak here and um, reflect a bit about the preliminary findings of the Task Force on Financial Sustainability with regards to federating data in EOSC. So <clears throat> I would like to start with um, a small quote from our preliminary report, which was, which was just published uh, earlier this week, and you can find it on the EOSC webpage. So, it is possible to envisage that the EOS Data Federation should enable researchers to find and acquire data from multiple sources available at any of the levels of aggregation, local, institutional, national, thematic, European and international, through attribute-based discovery. A federation with these characteristics would lift the barriers of reusing data. Well, that sounds all very nice, but actually when the task was started looking at what data federation or federating data means for EOSC, we faced a lot of challenges because it is the component in the minimal viable EOSC that is the least defined. Um, so we were very much facing the issues like, okay, how, how can we find a financial model for something that is not defined? And for that reason, um, we actually looked at the um, different components, looked at what we wanted to do, and then decided that we want to take the approach of different use cases. Um, and one of them is Blue Cloud. The other ones were the SESTA, DISCO, and the COVID-19 data portal, um, because those use cases have already shown what, how federating data can be possible in different domains. And Blue Cloud is a good example because it is actually quite different domains. So it is marine biology, it is 
uh, from the private, the private sector is involved, so it is a diverse community that is coming together, like EOSC, on a just smaller scale. And some lessons learned from the uh, first, from the first initial use cases were that data and services must go together in EOSC, um, even if they have different financial requirements, because only the services or only the data without the other do not provide the needed added value for the researchers. Then also federating data implies interoperability between the different levels of aggregations that I just named, so local, institutional, um, national, thematic, but also European and international. And also data federation must rely on the existing repositories and fair federations on all level in order to um, be discoverable. And because they're relying on the dis existing repositories, they rely on the existing infrastructures and the thematic ecosystems. And they need, the federation of data needs to avoid a duplication of effort in that sense. But, and I think we've heard that already in the past days of the symposium again and again, um, there are the European common data spaces, the GAIA-X initiative, and also global, European, uh, global Open Science Cloud, and other things that need to be connected with EOSC, um, because otherwise we will face interoperability issues on yet another level again. And finally, um, the establishment of EOSC on a global level will help with visibility uh, and thus also with funding, but also increase uh, the competitiveness of Europe. So when looking at the use cases again, we looked at what are the options out there? How could data be federated? And we came up with four different potential models. Um, so one is the overlay. Then there's the metadata catalog, the catalog of data providers and the platforms, and natural evolution. Uh, we had not yet the time to look at all of these different models in much detail, so we focused very much on the overlay, which is the most um, complex. Um, and that would provide a centrally managed and maintain, uh, would be centrally managed and um, maintained by EOSC. It would enable the data discovery from any provider and it would ensure data interoperability. But of course, it's, because it's the most complex, it's also the most costly thing to do. Uh, another option would be the metadata catalog, which could achieve interoperability. And um, I think, Sarah, you mentioned it already at a different session. So Blue Cloud actually lies a bit in between of um, not being a complete overlay, but definitely being more than just a metadata catalog. So in that sense, Blue Cloud was really a good example for us to look at. Um, then there was, there's the option of just a catalog of data providers and platforms. So not referencing any data or data sets per se, but just saying, well, if you're looking for data from this kind of discipline or this kind of domain or that kind of country, look there. Um, this doesn't achieve interoperability per se, but would at least increase the discoverability of the different uh, data providers in that sense. Uh, and then there's natural evolution, which is kind of what is going on now. So there are initiatives, there are providing slow convergence into the same direction, but this is of course a very slow process and because it would be uh, non-coordinated, it would actually be also quite costly because there would be duplications of efforts, um, it would not necessarily always converge in the same direction, so it would need correction over time. So this is definitely uh, something as a task so that we said, well, if possible, this should be avoided. Another thing that we identified through the use cases was that there are additional costs, but not just in establishing the federation of data, but to actually make data fair. Um, so there are the operational costs, there are the development costs, there are legacy costs with regards to fair data. Um, it is also additional costs to make experiments reproducible with all the workflows, the data analysis environments, software catalogs, transfer protocols, etc. And there is a dedicated task force actually existing to that, which we're 
um, collaborating, so ensuring long-term access to data, it's something that will cost money, not necessarily on the level of EASC per se, but on the levels below. And then federating the data into EASC, it doesn't come from nowhere, so the connection between the different local, national, European thematic repositories need to be established to actually um, make the data interoperable and, and create the connection between the layers. Um, but these are all costs that are not necessarily visible when you're looking at, except for the last column, but these are things that are quite costly and these are things that we need to flag because these responsibilities are not always clarified. So who is responsible for making the data fit? Is it just simply the researchers at the local institutions? Is it um, the different repositories that are then actually archiving the data and curating it? Um, who is ensuring the, the long-term access? Is it once the, the data is deposited in the repository? Is it the repository that's responsible for maintaining and updating, curating the data the whole time? Or is still the researcher who has initially, initially deposited the data there? Is he still continuously responsible for his or her data? These are all questions that are still ne that need to be clarified, where responsibilities need to be clarified, but also it needs to be clarified who's going to pay for it. And so we're still facing a lot of questions in the task force, so we don't have that many solutions yet. Um, but we have some interim conclusions and definitely some next steps that uh, we want to take. So we are facing different options and we're actually currently trying to test the waters with different stakeholders. What are the most feasible solutions in terms of which model should we actually focus on to find a financial model for? Um, then, as I said before, the costs and responsibilities should be assigned to the right level um, so that it's clear who's responsible also in terms of funding. Then we might actually look at further case studies to enrich the findings that we have and compare to the existing use cases like Blue Cloud, um, what could or could not work for EASC. But then also um, can look at the EC Commission study on the European data landscape and the outputs from the task forces like long-term data pre preservation and also fair metrics and data quality to not work in a silo but actually connect with the findings um, from elsewhere to make sure that our findings are actually compatible with theirs. But then um, also check out if we can seek alignment with the common data spaces, with the um, ideas that are coming up there for example, with regards to the smart middleware software. And also a big question that still remains is, there are Blue Cloud, other thematic um, infrastructures or portals like the COVID-19 data platform. They're here to stay for the time being. So EOS needs to make sure that it, the, the solution that is found is complementary to those existing thematic portals and that it doesn't become another competitor to it, so that they are integrated and they're complementary to each other without duplicating efforts, without being something that is in addition and makes the other one obsolete, um, and also not competitive to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So after this introduction, I'll try to explain you a little bit about Blue Cloud and how it fits into this context. So uh, Blue Cloud delivers three main products or assets that we have. So there is a virtual research environment that is the place where services to facilitate orchestration and the, all the analytical services to perform experiments are uh, hosted. Uh, this is feeding into the uh, EOSC core uh, component. On another layer, we have the virtual labs uh, that are uh, analytical workflows uh, configured to support five real life demonstrators and uh, they can be adapted to different communities. And in this sense, they um, offer, let's say, the, um, these, these uh, uh, services to the exchange uh, component. All the services are already available on the EOSC uh, portal. 
The, the last layer is the data discovery and access service. Uh, that is a search engine. It federates uh, the key European uh, marine blue data uh, providers that are um, involved in blue cloud and facilitate finding and retrieving of this data. And that's the component that uh, fits into the uh, data federation uh, of EOSC. Uh, this is the overarching concept of Blue Cloud, as we've seen. So uh, we have this virtual research environment, what the services are. Uh, there are um, uh, standards applied and uh, interoperability solutions for harmonized the data uh, there. And then um, uh, there is this uh, uh, discovery and access service to allow the retrieval of the data uh, at the bottom of the layer. How Blue Cloud positions with respect to EOSC? Uh, Blue Cloud understands there is a win-win uh, where EOSC offers the framework, let's say the container, to implement the data harmonization uh, of, uh, that, that we see uh, working in the Blue Cloud virtual research and environment. And the interaction between different communities in EOSC will feed uh, uh, examples, I mean, the and then are already taking place. We are onboarding new virtual research environment within the Blue Cloud infrastructure using the tools there, but coming from other projects and other communities. And that's a way to show the value of uh, the interactions and uh, of bringing together different users within EOSC. On the other side, uh, Blue Cloud um, is in a position, a privileged position to align the role of the, these data providers, the marine data providers within uh, the European uh, framework and with the European infrastructures. So to ensure that our data providers, so Amonet, Copernicus, C, Datanet, but we have more, uh, are visible and receive added value uh, in EOSC while, of course, providing the data to the EOSC users. So you might have seen the booklet that was distributed these days uh, gathering all the information about uh, the EOSC infra projects. Blue Cloud is um, one of them. And uh, in there you can see the analysis we've done as part of the project to understand the exploitation opportunities of each of the assets in Blue Cloud by 2030. Actually, it's a snapshot because you'll see six services there, but we, we have more. Uh, but of course, for um, harmonization reasons, uh, they, they've been uh, restricted to six. What I've also done that you, you cannot find in that booklet, but you'll find in the exploitation plan that will be published by, before the end of the year, uh, we have also tried to quantify uh, the costs associated to the op op operating and maintaining the services up to 2030. And while uh, doing this analysis with the Blue Cloud partner in the consortium, we have identified three main sources of funding uh, for uh, them uh, to actually maintain the services. Uh, there are services which, uh, so there is a, a public, let's say, components, so with funding coming from European Union, European Commission, and other public funding um, sources. Uh, there are funding coming directly from research institutes and academia, European, but not only Europeans. And then there is a, a, a private contracts and partnerships with other commercial agreements in some cases. So I'm just showing you uh, three examples that relates to the Blue Cloud assets. So for instance, if we look at the virtual research environment, so the analytical frameworks, this is, let's uh, say, the component that gets resources from the more different, let's say, funding uh, types. So. Um, You'll see we have all the free icons there. So uh, Blue Cloud is powered by Defo Science managed by CNR in, in Italy. So uh, it gets funding by the public uh, funding source in Italy, gets funded by the European Commission, but it also has commercial uh, contract with other uh, entities in, in different domains that actually use the same technology and thus is an, as an additional source of income. If we look at the virtual lab for fisheries data, and, uh, we have Hanton Ellenbrook here, uh, it's managing that. In that case, uh, the, uh, the, the, let's say the funding come from uh, 
institutes and research institutes. In particular, so uh, there is an agreement between CNR and FAO. And the sustainability up to 2030 is guaranteed by this type of funding without uh, the contribution from European Commission funding, for instance. Last, the data discovery and access services, so our data federation component in this case is only public money coming from the current uh, project. We have also tried to quantify, you'll see some numbers in terms of millions of euro needed to maintain this up to 2030. Of course, this is a preliminary analysis done within the consortium. What we haven't done, but we, we hope we'll manage to do that uh, by the end of the project in March, is to try and have this figure by the data providers themselves. So what, what do they pay? What's their cost for uh, providing the data as we are able to access them today? Briefly, a um, few words about the data discovery and access services. So it's a search engine, I've already said that, that facilitate the discovery and retrieval of data sets. Uh, we have actually access to circa uh, 25,000 entries, which are indexed by uh, using B2Find, by the way, of the level of the data collections. But if you go into a deeper level, so additional, using additional searching criteria, uh, the data we can users can actually access and use uh, are more than 10 million coming from different sources. So we have physics, data, biology, geology, bathymetry, and chemistry, exactly thanks to the <coughs> data providers that are federated in these search engines. And you can see them um, here. And there is a two-level approach, there is a shopping basket, so we also try to uh, um, add some, I mean, uh, user-friendly facilities. Maris, the technical coordinator of Blue Cloud, is behind the development of the service. Jessica presented before the architectural models that EOSC tried to identify for data federation. And uh, while looking at the data discovery services, it fits in between the overlay, which is the most desirable and complete, let's say, way of accessing the data, and a metadata catalog. So there is a lot of text here, I understand, but uh, I wanted to give you some more information. So. Uh, at level one, uh, the service maintains a common metadata of data collections uh, and of, of those famous blue cloud, uh, the, sorry, blue data infrastructures that are in the, in the project. And that's where these 25,000 entries come from associated to data collections. And this is done in partnership with, uh, in partnership exploiting uh, b 2 find uh, resources and they are uh, accessible from uh, the, the marketplace. But, as said, if we go to a second level, the granularity gets higher. Uh, so, uh, with additional searching criteria, the results are much more. And uh, this brokering service is the one that, I mean, brings us thinking that this model is, is actually close to an overlay level, so it facilitates a lot, I mean, the retrieval of, of data. Okay, so I hope it was useful. I now pass the floor to Anton Ellenbrock, who is going to talk about fair duration of fisheries data. Okay, yes, uh, good morning still. Uh, Anton Ellenbrock, I work in Rome for FAO of the UN, and I work in the fisheries department where we our task to collect data on uh, fisheries catch, um, efforts to catch the fish, and to work with human beings and collect data in countries like Mozambique, where they have one guy without petrol in his tank to do the fisheries monitoring. So we are quite far away from EOSC or all the uh, fancy, oh sorry, not so fancy, uh, all the, the technical discussions, but we are really hoping that we can uh, continue our collaboration. So we have, since a few years, we have uh, worked with various Horizon uh, 2020 projects, so that went very well. So we have used a lot of um, solutions presented through these various projects to help people to organize the data collection for their fish and fisheries and aquaculture, and to bring this into a much more open and uh, accessible set of platforms. It's not a single one many different um, activities. 
I will be a bit quicker with this slide because I miss one. I won't. So let's that, that just uh, explain first so how, how FAO then works for this uh, data collection. So you start at the far left where we have field data collection. So that is that one guy with this uh, uh, mobile app to collect some catches. And then everybody uses uh, every country, every in-country have different people that have different uh, data collection schemes. So all the data are brought together, but not together together. They are brought into a system. So then it's the whole task for FAO. How do we make sense of this. So we have a data collection uh, application on the left that then pushes the data into like the more central layer, the analysis layer, where we have um, then the task to make all the data harmonized and standardized. Well, it's a huge task and we use a lot of reference data. So all the reference data are stored. So the, for instance, how do you convert a reported tuna which has the head cut off and the tails cut off and all the internals taken out, how do you convert it back to the life weight of the tuna? So all those things are reference data that we share also through like centralized services. So it's sort of like an EOSC approach for data sharing, data management, but then applied to fishery. Then we bring that data together with data from other organizations. So in this uh, slide in the middle you see for instance two examples where we bring data together uh, with uh, regional databases. So not only FEO collects data, you also have other organizations and we have to merge the data to make a global overview of what is happening in a fisheries area. It is all very uh, data management -y side of talks, so maybe um, the analysis of the data then goes to a group of scientists that have to say, okay, so now we have your catch data, 70 years of a time series or only a few years of a time series, what was the exploitation level of your fish? So there you start really getting the scientists involved. But how can they rely on the data? So do they trust the data that they have received from the people that were working on the left? What are the quality indicators of the data that arrive with the scientists when they start doing their stock assessment? And what stock assessment model do they apply? So a lot of computational questions, but also a lot of data management questions, uh, a lot of uh, questions about trust, reliability and coverage of data. And then you run your analysis, so that's very helpful where we had a, a good powerful infrastructure. So some of these um, Working group. So this afternoon, one is uh, ongoing now in Miami, for instance, and they use a VRE, so a virtual research environment, where everybody can log in and they get the same, exactly the same uh, set of software to analyze the data that they have collected all over the Caribbean. People can start to compare the data and work together in a community of practice. And then we push the data into various uh, sets of information products. So for instance, the FISH.J, that is the global FAO database on uh, reported catch uh, at na uh, national level. Then the data are also uh, published in SOFIA. So if you read in the newspaper about the uh, FAO report, it's usually the SOFIA report. And then we also publish data in open uh, public, or public uh, databases like the global record of stocks and fisheries and the global tuna atlas. The, all these products, they so now have a, we have a, a common data flow. So we, have, uh, we are increasing our grip on the data. So we understand much better now what is the quality of the data, the origin of the data, how it was processed, what sort of uh, reliability there are, quality indicators, etc. And all thanks to these EU projects that help us to integrate this in the European infrastructures. So we have a real community of practice, so I, I, I explained a bit how FVO collects the data, but we also do this in collaboration with a lot of other organizations. And we have, for instance, the firms partnership, the Fisheries Information and Resource Management Partnership, where there are, I think, now 45 members across the planet. And everybody, at least uh, at, a, at a discussion level, they share ideas, they share concepts of how to uh, report fish how to collaborate, and if they are in need of a IT support, we have this VRE option through the for science that is then uh, related to EOSC, where we can offer them something where this is a collaboration tool. If you want R, uh, you want the R Studio, we drop it in that uh, collaboration tool. If you want to do a Jupyter notebook, we drop it there, and you just uh, are happy and start collecting, analyzing your own data. <coughs> so it's a working community of practice, uh, and we fund parts of it. So we also, if people have a need for a collaboration tool, FEO funds them and then we also pay for a VRE software, a sort of a EOSC related uh, activity. So you have some sort of a, already a funding idea how this could uh, operate in the future. A bit uh, maybe sort of this co-design idea, so the Federation in the Fisheries Atlas. So the Fisheries Atlas is a global atlas of uh, fisheries. 
it is not a the final atlas, which more a collaborative atlas. So how do you work with people to prepare the data so that they are of good enough quality to be shared with a wider audience? FAO is, uh, of course, driven by the Sustainable Development Goals, especially Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is about uh, fisheries, and then 441, which is then about the status of the exploitation of stocks. So yeah, are these stocks exploited sustainably, or are they overexploited, or are they underexploited? Yes, they exist underexploited fishery stocks. So, for instance, here we have uh, in this first theory, this is like this SDG 1441 theory where people can go in, bring their data, do a stock analysis, and all done in R and with R Studio, and then you, or you write some procedures directly in a MySQL database, but all in this uh, same deeper science infrastructure. We now have trained 750 people, which is quite an effort to, uh, to go around the planet and bring a training, uh, bring people to the training explain them what they have to bring as in terms of data, in terms of data analysis, and then follow with them through after the training if they can generate this SDG 1441 indicator. So I think this is a quite a success for at least uh, online training courses using EU platforms. The second one, the uh, Tuna Atlas, it has only 68 registered users, but these are high-level users. So these are people that work with uh, the five uh, tuna bodies on the planet. So they have, the ocean is uh, divided in several oceans, as you know. And each of these has a different management organization that brings the data together and raises them to a level where they can become public. So there's few users, but a wide audience that access this uh, data resource through the FEO uh, Tuna Atlas, which is online and accessible through the FEO website. So via TAF, if you ever heard reading the newspapers about exploitation levels and FEO, this is, comes from the SOFIA report. And the SOFIA report is a global overview of uh, fisheries, and there is also now ongoing with the training events using this infrastructure. And now there's a training in Miami with uh, some 15 people. And they are working together to um, prepare for the next report on SOFIA, also using this EU infrastructure support. Global record of stocks and fisheries are a bit the same, so we work there with this community of practice that collaborates to bring the data with uh, the University of Washington does the scientific data. Then we have a um, sustainable fisheries partnership that does uh, commercial data. And they really work together with FVO to get the full traceability of fisheries, so from the catch to the shop. And then we bring this into a, using a persistent identifiers, UUIDs, in this global record of stocks and fisheries. And it's all online and done through this uh, same infrastructure. And then so you see uh, then a, a bit of the, the tool stack at the bottom. So we start with R and then all the way to Docker. You push it in your infrastructure and then it becomes part of the DeFi Science infrastructure. And that is when again we're part of the blue cloud and then we are very close to EOSC. So this is two, just two examples. So the Federation Fisheries Atlas that we reuse a lot of our uh, stuff. So you see there are two separate workflows. that could. Uh, Logically completely separated, the data are completely separated, but they use the same technology. So if you're a component in one of these two workflows, also the other workflow can automatically be updated. So this increases the efficiency and lowers the cost for us to manage this infrastructure. So we, we see a lot of uh, advantages in reusing and we have been successful in reusing components. This is just a nice uh, image from the global record of structured fisheries. So I explained before how we collect the data, and this is a bit the result. So you see we have a quite a good global coverage, still biased towards Europe, but yeah, what can we do? The data are the data. Um, but you see also that there are stocks and fisheries um, on all the different oceans of the planet, so we have managed to have at least a global coverage, even if it's not complete. Now I'll skip this one. And, uh, so, uh, explain this. so then there is a, another activity, so we were funded through this Blue Cloud um, EU project and then there was a question, so can Blue Cloud and FNS Cloud, so more the fish as an animal and fish as a food product, can they al already uh, work towards an integration? So maybe not especially a complete uh, federation, but a, like where you really share the data, but can there also already be some sort of interoperability? So we, do we share concepts? Uh, yes, we do share sort of a concept. A fish is a fish, no? Do we share vocabularies? No, we didn't. Do we share the same level of quality assessment and quality control on the data item? No, so we really had to start working with uh, Mr. Carl here to say, okay, so where are you actually starting from and can we already conceive of a sort of collaboration on the, if we discuss about the topics coming from the fisheries domain? 
is there a shared vision on provenance and traceability? So for him, provenance is something completely different as for me. So for me, provenance is where did the fish come from? For him, is it how did it arrive in my factory? Which is sometimes very different. Is there an overlap in food descriptions? I think that is where we manage to find some common ground or common sea. And that is the food X2, the standardized classification and uh, describing food. So foods and the process they have been gone through can be described with a sort of a, a language called food X2. And both FEO can use it in four parts of the workflow. And then he can pick up on the rest of the workflow. So together, if we work together, we could then have a full description of a, a fish. We tested that with uh, UFISH2, which is a blue cloud fish food composition tool. So you can uh, pull up the tool and then you say, I have a new uh, food description here, and you enter it. And then you cover both the fishery side, because we cover like the physical provenance of that fish. But we also cover the food composition side. And then with FoodX2 combined with FoodX, uh, with UFISH2, you get a very interesting traceability on a fish product. It's just an uh, Angular Java application that we dockerized and pushed into the Deeper Science infrastructure. So in theory, it can already be considered, if you have a bit of a stretched mind, as part of a EOSC uh, cloud infrastructure. It was an interesting experience for us, and we, FEO is considering to, uh, to keep funding this in direct funded through FEO for further development. So also there you see like a spin-off of uh, a, a EOSC-related activity being picked up by a community and receiving further funding for a targeted objective. So yeah, you just see that like it's a screenshot, so it's a UFISH tool for food systems, where we see I have a combined interest of FEO, the top layer with then a food and nutrition composition layer uh, for each of the products that we have uh, pushed into this uh, UFISH tool. So we were, as FEO, quite interested in what was already possible with this uh, infrastructure. So we also did a few experiments on the infrastructure, uh, all related from farm to fork, or in your language, maybe server farm to git fork. But you see here just a few examples of how we start with a large data set, how we combine different data sets, and in this case, apply some artificial intelligence to have more, better uh, or new species distribution maps for a few of commercially interested species and also some other fun species like the giant squid that we were just playing with because we were not interfering with any uh, serious commercial interests. And well, so that was my quick overview of how FAO collects data, how FAO relates to European infrastructures and how we think we can continue collaborating in the future even if FAO cannot be part of Horizon Europe directly. How we think we can, by funding ourselves activities related to this cloud and then through a direct collaboration, maybe with infrastructure providers, continue what for us has been a very interesting and effective collaboration. Okay. Any quick questions? Long questions? Bye -bye. Thanks, Anton. Is there are any questions? Feel free to. Yes, there is one. We have a microphone. Just a second. Thanks a lot. This was quite impressive, um, this demonstration. Um, in between, you mentioned kind of that uh, scientists uh, do their analysis um, and, uh, of course, come to results, hopefully, and they are eventually published. And I wonder if kind of these results are then again registered in your catalogs, in your kind of domain specific catalogs, and as well, top in the B2 find thing. This works, huh? Yes. yes. It works. <laughs> Better than me. <laughs> um, no, so it's a scientific experiment for in fisheries. Usually it's a group of scientists that do a stock assessment. And they collaborate. And they own then also the results. And whatever they want to do with the results, it's up to them. We cannot force them. What we try to do with the global record of stocks in fishery is exactly what you say. So we capture um, a stock. And the stock becomes a... a identified unit where you can attach all your data to. So you attach your time series of catch in that stock. You have a reference to the fleet that we're targeting that stock. You have the management uh, units of that stock. So a lot of information that you need to manage a fishery. So it's even, it even goes much further than what you just asked for if we deposit uh, like the output in a public registry. Now we try to capture everything in a publicly accessible data set. 
Uh, the, sorry, the knowledge base. Like, and then with the Sparkle endpoint, you can then do competence queries, etc. Uh, but then, so the whole thing becomes much more complex than just publishing a output in a repository. It becomes a information system by itself. And I really do not know how to publish all that in a registry. But I think it is also maybe an interesting question. So, yeah, how do you? you a lot of experiments require data from other people that have analyzed already data that came from somebody else and maybe there you have then the observations and measurements done on natural phenomena. But all the rest is like a human process with a lot of interpretations and errors and mistakes. And we have in FEO also a proof of evidence approach where we try to work to capture all the steps in a data workflow. And then only based on that you can then make your own interpretation. So you cannot say this is, this is then the result. Because if you apply, if you, for instance, in a lot of experience we set priors, if you change the priors just a little bit, the things go either through the roof or sink to the bottom. And we, so we can, it's difficult for us to say, okay, this is the result and this is the output that we publish in the repository. So we want to keep a bit more flexibility. Then, but then the official outputs, they all go into FAO reports and uh, we try then to always reference the good people of the EU that helped us to generate the results. Sometimes we forget. Thank you, Anton. Now, I welcome Karl Presser from Premotech and also uh, the FNS Cloud uh, Horizon 2020 project. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, I would like to um, show you the FNS Cloud and then how we, we do the data federation in there and then how we collaborate with the Blue Cloud. Um, what is the FNS Cloud? So maybe the name was not perfectly chosen. It's also called the Food Cloud. Uh, so we are considering the food. So FNS stands for Food Nutrition Security. Uh, so that's the security in food, but also nutrition. It's also a um, thematic EOS Cloud. And, um, the European Commission calls us the CIS project of the Blue Cloud, and if we want to be gender neutral, should be the sibling project of uh, Blue Cloud. And as Anton said, so the Blue Cloud is taking care of the fish, and we want to eat them. So a little bit feel sorry for for this one in the Blue Cloud, but yeah, it belongs to to our nutrition. Um, the goal is uh, the FNS Cloud. We're we're pretty much ten years behind the Blue Cloud. So because the Blue Cloud there started already on a very high level uh, with a lot of resources that they can use and, and develop these um, virtual research um, environments and, and discovery services. Well, really we need to, to, to bring together the, the community and then develop a first generation food cloud. And so for us it was really kind of find out the areas that are available, the topics, uh, where are the data and bring them together uh, in a first approach. And we had also we're quite a big consortium um, with, with 35 beneficiaries from 11 countries plus some non-EU member countries. And yeah, we have also a four years project running and ending, and ending next year. So. In the food cloud, the biggest problem is, as you also know, with, with, uh, with all this um, food industry, they are quite um, spread over Europe. So we have a high fragmentation there. Uh, we have uh, national um, databases because every country has its own foods, right? <coughs> so like in the, the Swiss fondue is, is not maybe, it's known, but not maybe not exists in all other countries. And so every country has its specialties, even regional specialties are, are there, and also institutional um, data sources and, and apps are, uh, and resources are available. And so this fragmentation is quite high. Um, the reason is also Anton a little bit um, described it, is, is living data because uh, food data is also if you have a national composition data, food composition database, which is information about the nutrient content, the contamination content in food. Um, this is a living database, so you cannot just one measure once, put it online, and that's it. So you need to redo it uh, um, frequently and regularly. And so we basically, in, um, the most countries in Europe publish these data um, every year. There's a new version because there was new new measurements, new common contamination uh, were detected, and so on. So this is also living. Uh, so we cannot put it in a central database, but uh, the, the ministries mostly maintain the database. Um, on a regular basis. And that's also the one of the reasons that not many central databases exist. So all the countries have their databases um, that they maintain. And yeah, so this makes uh, basically quite a big challenge for the findability uh, in, um, in, in the food cloud. So this federation and then federate this data is, is, is a challenge because it's, it's the fragmentation is so huge. 
Um, so just to show how far blue cloud is, um, I show you how, how the FNS cloud, how far we're behind. Because if you really start um, to think about data federation, the first is, um, yeah, the solution is deliverable, uh, which we're heading, um, where we started with a map. So basically we're trying to put all the topics in, in, the, in the food science on a map that we have the different areas and try then to um, all the resources that there are available, uh, the data resources, um, put on the map so that we have, uh, that we know in which, in which topic we have a lot of data and in which topics we don't have data. It also um, happens quite often, which will um, surprise us very much. And exactly, and so for then each of these topics, um, we went there and said, okay, let's define a transfer uh, model. So whenever you design, when, when, whenever you design a database, it's up to you how you decide, right? What what entities and attributes you basically design. But when you start to transfer data between systems, uh, you need a common understanding. And so uh, we started there and say, okay, let's define a, a transfer data model. What entities are transferred? What is a food exactly? What is a food sample? Uh, what are nutrient information and so on? And so we defined this one also using a lot of existing uh, vocabularies, controlled uh, vocabularies from, from FAO, um, but also from, from European, European, European organizations, which are already there. And where necessary, we added our own control vocabularies. We also defined there APIs for each of the topics so that we exactly know how is the, the signature of an API, how is it defined, what, what parameters you need to provide and what, what you're getting back to results. So this is kind of uh, the basic level, let's say the technical for, for a data federation. Um, we also needed to start to, to recommend in the community that to use central databases because every university or research organization had their own um, Excel files, sometimes they had databases, but mostly Excel files, and we said if they can try uh, to create databases, we are somehow then able to put a discovery service on top. But if we're working with Excel files, there's no chance, right, to do to this one. And yeah, this transfer model and the API definition is, of course, the very basic step on top. Now, the next is um, we're creating a first generation ontology uh, that we're using, of course, existing ones like Foodon in, in the in food area, quite a, a, a famous one, and some others. Uh, we are bringing them, taking the parts out, uh, reusing them, and adding our parts um, in there. We call it the FNS Harmony uh, ontology. Uh, which helps them to describe the data that it can automatically be interpreted and transferred as well. Uh, so this helps for the transformation. And on the right side you see some definitions. So because we did this um, data models for all the topics, we yeah, had quite a long, this deliverable was over 150 pages and um, because we needed all provide this, this, this definitions there so this used yeah quite quite a lot of things and this is just the baseline for a data federation um, we will not get further in, in the FNS project unfortunately because yeah we're just running out of time and we will also need the next 10 years like the blue cloud to get more um, to, to databases uh, data resources and then we can and then we can start to federate them together that's it Carl. Thank you. Any questions for Carl? Not now, maybe. So we've seen two examples of what's happening now in Blue Cloud, and now leave the floor to Alessandro Rizzo from Ferries. He's going to talk what's going to happen in the future and how we are going to leverage on the good work of Ferries. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for welcoming and for giving me the opportunity to introduce you uh, a new project called Ferries. I am Alessandro. My name is Alessandro Rizzo. Uh, I'm working in a in French Institute of Research called IRD, the French National Research on Sustainable Development, and I'm the coordinator of the project Ferries. Um, my presentation will be more general and uh, the project started a couple of months ago. Uh, we are at the very beginning of our activities and development. Uh, for that I don't have any uh, solution or any results of our activity to present, but we'd like to introduce just the methodology of the project and why eventually uh, Blue Cloud and the Ferries uh, can usefully uh, work together. Um, well, uh, the, the overall 
objective of the project, of this project, uh, is uh, to customize and operate uh, uh, integrated services uh, for earth system, environment, and biodiversity, improving uh, their components constantly, and in close cooperation uh, with the user community. This is an important point, and research communities and. Uh, um, research infrastructure so, uh, for, for the development of course, but also for the sustainable availability. Uh, the consortium of FERIS is composed by 26 members that are research performing organizations and universities in Europe and uh, members, the most of them members of research infrastructure at European level and nationally. Uh, some of them are members also of the consortium, uh, but it's important to point out that data providers are normally outside of the projects. Then, uh, at the foundation of the theories, uh, uh, there are uh, two basic uh, uh, specific assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that today, uh, observing, understanding uh, a model in the Earth system and uh, the integrating functioning, uh, as well as uh, predicting their response to global changes is, uh, is a key uh, challenge uh, scientifically and technically uh, also is necessity uh, is necessary just to, to understand uh, other uh, application in terms of socio-economic applications. The second uh, assumption of the project uh, is that uh, uh, even if uh, the Earth system uh, domains are completely interconnected uh, today, the, the digital architecture uh, is based normally on a distributed uh, and domain dependent data repository and uh, that avoid uh, any in integrated uses uh, of all uh, environmental data. Then the, uh, the project aims uh, to meet these challenges by facilitating access uh, to a diversity of environmental data from uh, uh, different uh, subsystems uh, and environments, as uh, it's indicated here on the, on the left. And uh, the general uh, methodology workflow is based on the harmonization of pre-selected operational services and the expansion of their fields of application. Uh, these services, uh, it is evident that these services uh, whose validation will be performed using uh, real-life uh, uh, experience uh, from uh, research communities uh, are structured around uh, some specific uh, technical requirements uh, such as uh, uh, vocabularies and ontologies to use the data uh, in aggregating uh, um, metadata harvesting service, and uh, uh, furthermore, to meet the need uh, to remotely uh, analyze and process uh, a large amount of heterogeneous data, also um, host platforms such as virtual research environment uh, and virtual analysis platform uh, will be performed and developed within the framework of the project. At the end, Feriz uh, wants to provide two different services. Uh, the first one is the Ferris Data Discovery and DAX Interdisciplinary Service, and it is really linked uh, to Blue Cloud, of course, and the second service is the Enerf Analytic Lab. Then, the services, the, sorry, the first services is the, the first Data Discovery and DAX Interdisciplinary Service. It will provide the user with the, with the first service to, to access, to discover and access data. Is a service will uh, adopt and adapt the solution, the so-called Blue Cloud Data Discovery and Access Service, uh, which works uh, with the brokerage uh, service uh, at Metadata Data Level. Uh, furthermore, on the project uh, uh, plans to develop and operate also uh, a semantic brokerage service component to overcome semantic differences among a within. Uh, communities uh, of users and data providers. And on the other hand, the second service is an Earth Analytic Lab just to provide users with uh, an easy way to analyze, process a large amount of data with VRE and VAP and visualization services, of course. Um, 
finally, in the question uh, that I would like to point out uh, today in terms of collaboration among projects is that FELIS is based on an interdisciplinary approach and is based on the requirements coming from uh, uh, some domains uh, within the framework of their system and environmental biodiversity. Then we have developed uh, and we are going to implement three different use cases. Uh, the first use case is earth and environmental dynamics, environmental biogeochemical assets, uh, biodiversity observation. Then we, have, we are gathering a lot of services coming from these uh, communities and we want to integrate services across the domain just to make, make this service available to other communities. Then, uh, the most important point is the interoperability process and approach that we are going to, to implement and we are going to develop within the framework, bringing together different communities and different areas of knowledge and research, but to, to take all different challenges uh, within the framework of their system and environment, so we need to develop synergy and uh, we need to develop within the framework of the different uh, domains, but also within the framework of different projects, probably in the EOSC, uh, we need to develop some synergy effects, and then it's important to, to, to take this into account so today, and I'm really happy to, to have the opportunity to discuss with the Blue Cloud community that we are really involved, deeply involved also in the development of different solutions promoted by, by the project phase. I, can, I think that I can stop there, but if you have any question, of course, don't hesitate. Thanks, Alessandro. Yes, are there any questions for Alessandro? Okay, okay now we'll, we'll try to spend the last 20 minutes or so uh, with you. So I kindly ask you to take your phones or whatever you uh, you have uh, available and uh, join this very short uh, Mentimeter discussion. So if you can scan the QR code or join menti.com and type in that code that you can see on screen. So it's 84, 66, 12, 43. While you do that, uh, I'll move on to the Yes, and here you are. So first is a question who you are, I mean, and what are your data providers? If you can say a few, if you don't represent, I mean, an, a research infrastructure working with data, or if you are a user, just provide your, uh, your inputs. It's really to understand, I mean, who we have, who we have in the audience. Yeah. Researchers and government. University panomic platforms. Can I ask who provided information to explain a bit? Who was? Yes. Can, I think we have a microphone somewhere. Yeah, uh, so uh, I forgot the H, sorry. But it's Phenomic Platform, so it's a researcher and a platform that do, are doing experiments about uh, vegetables and taking pictures and measurements and elaborated data uh, from the pictures. Thanks. Then we see researchers as data providers, which is most difficult. <laughs> they don't pass through aggregators and huge repository as Pangea and WWDCC, which is something similar to what, I mean, we are doing a blue cloud since we work with those data aggregators first. So, then if we move on, are you aware of the financial model to access the data you use? So 
have a kind of an idea, so that's something, it's not a no. Anybody wants to say what is this idea in the audience? Yes, Roxanne. Ah, okay. Well, I suppose it's every time you uh, are exploring a new data set from a new data provider, you again have to find out what the financial model is for accessing that data. So I suppose that, that's why I have kind of idea. <laughs> It's not something fixed. That's true, that's true. And that's also, I mean, we, we haven't really entered into the question within Blue Cloud, for instance, because we are luckily enough to work with data aggregators. They, they do the job in a certain way, and we come, we jump in into a second phase. And then the last one, and then I'll, we have some more questions for our uh, speakers, but do you see Blue Cloud as a replicable model for Data Federation? We have just given you some basic information we see about how it works. Of course, uh, you're more than welcome to ask more questions, but uh, we want to ask if your experience is something similar. So uh, Carl already said they're trying to evolve in something similar. Uh, for instance, some of the tools will be developed by fairies as well. So we could even argue, I mean, if you're still working on a community-based level of there is an interdisciplinary approach, and maybe in a desirable future, we go into a unique search engine <laughs> where everybody can find and browse data. So definitely to a certain extent. So I'm pretty uh, happy. <laughs> I was expecting only to rush can I answer later. So that's, uh, that's something good. Thanks. Um, Okay, just to, to move on. So we uh, we have uh, we want to explore still a bit our experts here today. So we have prepared a few uh, questions for for them uh, at the end. So Alessandro presented how Ferries is uh, uh, approaching, it's starting working on both a federation model, but they're also uh, doing probably something more on the verification aspects to respect of what uh, Blue Cloud is doing because they they introduced this community-based approach. So the question is, what are your recommendations with respect to cross-disciplinary, cross-national and cross-project collection and use of data? And how can cross-project collaboration stimulate fairness of marine data? Because, of course, we talk about that, but you can extend it to environmental data and boost data management sustainability. It's a pretty yeah. complex one. but Yeah, completely. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Uh, as I said before, I think that the, the most important now is a bottom-up approach, especially coming from different communities, research community and users, users and that provide of course, but uh, if you want to um, uh, foster and uh, enhance collaboration uh, among projects, among disciplines, uh, among cross-national, as, as you said, uh, is important to have uh, uh, the point of view of the different community of users. Then for that, uh, as I said, uh, on the project Ferries is based on, uh, uh, since the beginning of the, of the proposal, uh, on the design of the project, uh, uh, with the engagement uh, uh, coming from the different communities. I think today, if you want to have also uh, something that can be sustained Later, after the end of the project, it's important that the community is involved since the beginning of the process uh, until the end of the project. And uh, the most important is uh, uh, to take into account their needs and requirements, technically speaking and scientifically speaking, of course, because services are addressing to, to research communities at first, but not only for, for it is evident, especially within the framework of environment and our systems, because we, we have to take some global changes, and then it's important to, 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 to identify the different user profiles, of course. But it's, it's essential, it's crucial today, uh, because uh, the challenge is principally scientific uh, to have uh, on board the users and uh, researchers and uh, scientific communities, of course. Then this is, is important, on my point of view, is the primary recommendation I would like to, 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 to stress is just to, to have a direct contact and uh, interaction with community of users and researchers. Any other comment, any other experience, similar experience?
And now we go to the most difficult question, but we'll try to take it with a different angle. So public funding is the most visible part of the funding landscape. You have uh, recognized that. But um, the situation resembles that one of an iceberg. That's what uh, came out of the report Jessica uh, presented at the beginning. So I'm going to ask uh, Anton and Carl What's your experience in interaction with commercial entities, or I would say not public, uh, or not research entities, because we've seen Carl also works with uh, governments, for instance. And what are your recommendations on how to build a federation that also takes into account the needs and exploitation opportunities of the uh, private sector? Uh, the experience is good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, this is a, a very uh, big, big, big question. But I, I think if we look only at how we collect data, so like the more the technical infrastructure, I think what we had, where we have good experience with uh, commercial partners, for instance, in fish traceability, people are very interested where fish comes from. And at the first set was really a hook to manage um, how we collect and expose our data. We were driven by these requirements that came from the private sector where people wanted to show where the tuna came from, the end of the line, and then all the way to how it ended up in the shop. And it really helps us to stay focused on how a business operates, slightly different. They sometimes just walk away after three months and it's, oh, you're not interesting. And don't be discouraged then. Uh, there's always somebody else in the, a lot of fish in the sea. I think I'm running out of... Um, marine aphorisms very soon but uh, and then uh, with commercial entities so their times their scopes are usually different to ours so they want to sell things and we are want we want to basically manage things so you always have to be careful how you uh, enter in a collaboration with them and either if they are software providers or solution providers or if they are more in the trade and marketing uh, business their their time horizons and output horizons are slightly or very different from a government organization like FAO. And so the, the thing is to find a common ground and usually it is in uh, having a good quality data set that is for them the very difficult to access. So the, for instance in traceability it's easy to know where the fish came from but what are what were the imp how was that fish produced that is not something that these commercial entities have knowledge about. So you should try to think what sort of data do we manage as a government organization that would be interested for a private business even to pay for. So they are very open often to just pay for data that we already disseminate uh, as public data, but then not in the format or the time frame that they are interested in to getting it. Uh, so they, we have a list, for instance, of management organizations and uh, management units on the ocean. And for private companies, it's extremely difficult to get that data. So sometimes also look in the back of your uh, deep repository, and maybe the data that you have there are already of value for a company to start either a collaboration or just to buy them from them. There was another part. How about that's exactly the needs and exploitation opportunities to the private sector. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. Yeah, I can also have, we have two experiences, which is kind of was a funny story afterwards, but um, yeah, during the time it was quite hard. So um, for the Swiss government is, is responsible for the Swiss food composition database. Yeah, so in this database, we have all the food products and, and the label information you can find on them. So all this information um, there, they want to put in a public database. So they ask the, the alcohol industry in Switzerland if they can send the data. And they all refuse, rejected the request. Uh, why? Because this, uh, another department of the Swiss government was running an alcohol campaign um, that people should not drink too much alcohol. And this was, of course, uh, offensive against the alcohol industry. And at the same time, they asked for the data so that you realized um, this was a bad timing, basically. So they waited for two years, asked the industry again for the data, and then they received the data, basically. So it's just one of the examples. And so then, two years later, we published the data on, on the website, on this Swiss food composition database with all the, um, the data there. The industry was happy and said, okay, it looks good. And one year later, they asked us to implement a feature. In the, so, so the Swiss government asked if we can make a comparison so that we can compare two foods uh, with all the nutrients, the minerals, the, the vitamins, and, and so on. And so we implemented this, published it. 
and the industry came back again, oh, but now we have to remove all the industry products because you can start to compare the foods and they don't want it. So the, um, the, the one year later, all the food products was removed because of the industry. So um, it, it's very sensitive to collaborate with them, which basically we realized, okay, after these two experiences, um, we have to talk with them. We have really to, to sit down and talk with them, what, what is feasible for them, what, what they accept, where, where is the red line. Um, and, and what, where, where can, yeah, where they want to stop us. And this was um, a good experience to see because they're, they're open for discussion. And the main, the main um, recommendation there was kind of coming, um, saying that the food industry is very much interested in, in our food data because they need to um, produce this label information, right? This is mandatory by, by law, um, by policy. They have to put the data on. So they need also the input data because they need the, the ingredients like the water or the, the base ingredients and they can, can calculate the nutrients and this they need from um, a, a central database and from the research community. Also the research community is uh, producing a lot of information, so uh, protein information on in different foods and the industry is very much dependent on this one and also needs this information. So if they can see they're getting something from you and, and, and you requesting the data, um, this is kind of a win-win situation they see as a fair deal. And then they participate basically. Yeah. But the biggest, the biggest challenge was always then, yeah, get get on to the table with them, agree on something which they're happy in, um, and so that you can go this way. But so if if you produce a benefit for them, they're really open for for discussions. Is our recommendation there? Yeah. This also opens a lot of doors and windows when dealing with those sensitive data. So I mean. Uh, that is not a sensitive data, but I mean, dealing with fisheries sometimes is easier if like, <laughs> um, Anybody who wants to say something or have some similar experience or difficulties and challenges in working with uh, data providers? Actually, I, I wanted to ask some of those who, who, who said uh, that to up to a certain extent, uh, the, uh, the Blue Cloud case can be adapted or taken into consideration. Uh, I'd like a comment to say why yes and why no. Uh, if any of you who uh, chose that option before, mm -hmm. to a certain extent, any volunteer who wants to say something? You're too shy. <laughs> so, um, I had another question. I think it just let me check if you're still. Uh, I know that was the last one. So I, I give back the floor to Jessica, maybe for a, a final uh, comment uh, on the session. And huh? yes, so, oh, okay. I'm sorry, just. <laughs> no, right. That it was. Uh, that is fine. I can yeah. just say a few yeah. words like this. So I think. Um, Blue Cloud, but also the other use cases, so the, the different other clouds, the FNS Cloud and yeah. uh, uh, Fair East project really show that uh, there's a need for this domain and actually interdisciplinary things that then can be transferred to EOSC on a bigger level. Um, what we need to make sure is that it's actually a bottom-up approach. And I think this is something where, when you said that, it, is probably something where, where EOS can still have some lessons learned because it at least creates sometimes the perception that it's more top down rather than bottom up. So I think if EOS can manage to actually get the bottom up approach and engage the researcher communities from the different disciplines, um, then I think this can really be a great use case that we are already using from the uh, financial point of view, but also from different points of view to make EOSC a success. And I think these use cases also show that it's not just about services, it's not just about data, it's about both things together that are creating the added value because it's nice when you have the data, when you don't have the analysis tools to do anything with it, but the other way around, if it's nice to have these tools if you don't have the data to, to use the, uh, these tools. Um, so I think if this synergy also on the um, data services level is created, then I think we're, we're on a good track forward. 
Thanks, Jessica. In your report, you highlighted that the data federation aspect is the less evolved, let's say, in, in the EOSC. We have invited our data providers to join here today, so some had other commits when they, they couldn't. But actually, I would ask, I mean, the provocative question is where are the data providers in this, probably in this conference, in this context? Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there so, uh, for responding. What we are trying to do is to uh, talk with them even more in Blue Cloud. So we are organizing a meeting uh, early 2023rd, uh, for instance, to ask them how, how much does it cost for them to maintain the data and mine the data and uh, fair, make them fair uh, for us to use them. This is Blue Cloud 2026. So if you heard about it on uh, Tuesday, it's the, a new uh, project. So it's the follow-up of Blue Cloud, but within the remit of EOSC. So this is the change, let's say, in flow. Uh, we are continuing the work of Blue Cloud, concentrating on introducing more aspects of verification, that harmonization uh, of the data, but also introducing new uh, um, analytical uh, services. So introducing workbenches uh, for uh, um, uh, different uh, and outputs, I mean, in data uh, management to be given back also to the data aggregators themselves and use as products uh, across uh, other um, uh, in initiatives and domains. And uh, we are having our final conference on the 8th of December in Brussels. You'll also find some uh, mini flyers on your seat. So you're all welcome uh, to join us. So thank you very much for your participation. Thanks to our speakers, Alessandro, Jessica, Anton, and Carl. And let's continue some discussions over the lunch. Thank you very much.